Thank you. So I feel very, very lucky to get to be here with you all and to have gotten to be part of some of the conversation here in, in Sweden over the last 10 years, actually. I've learned a great deal from many experiences here. Um, and I'm grateful for not only the very open conversation that you all are leading in this region, in Europe. I think Sweden's more open to discussion of, of how do we shape cities and bringing in ideas from all over the world than any European country. Um, but even more importantly, how y your stewardship in the, in the world in terms of how these ideas are reflected and manifested in uh, the Global South as well. We have a strong partnership with UN Habitat, um, led by Swedes within that agency, uh, and certainly funded by the Swedish government as well, that, that are um, helping to really lead a global conversation around placemaking, public spaces, place-led development. So here in, in Uplands Vasby uh, is, is obviously a very exciting city to, to, to have this conversation in um, and the openness with which you're hosting these conversations uh, and bringing in many different ideas is really is exciting and it, this is a city that can, can manifest them in a ways with its fast growth um, and, and central location and, uh, and uh, sort of innovation, culture of innovation. And so I think you know, th that's a huge opportunity, but also the challenge is how do you become more than just being defined by those, those qualities? How do, how do you leverage the, 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 the qualities, the growth, the momentum of a city like this, and, and then invest them into the authenticity of what your community is about? How do, you, how do you make a city like that defined by people and places? not just by the, inve the new buildings, not just by design, not just by investment that's coming in, not just by its, its access and um, connections to, uh, to, to the, the region. So placemaking is really turning upside down the way we shape our cities, to start with people and places, and, bringing, and hopefully drawing on the best of many different disciplines and many skills, and making that conversation more accessible and constructive on many levels. So we've been lucky to work all over the world, uh, learning every part of the world is leading in these ways in some ways and holding back in others. Uh, we can explore how, you know, how Sweden's holding back in some ways as well. Um, but uh, the, there's this global placemaking movement going on. Our work has been applying placemaking and learning methodologies and, and advancing them in many parts of the world. More it's, increasingly, it's about training and communicating and building a global network uh, and a global movement for these ideas, and, uh, and we, a lot of our work is sharing this through our different communications channels on Twitter and in Facebook and online, and we, you know, so we hope to, to learn from your examples and share them as well. Um, but more than anything, our, our work is partnering with different movements and different causes, different disciplines, in, sh in looking at how they, when they focus on place, how they do everything differently and how they better collaborate with and bring new causes and disciplines to theirs. So the focus on place, we're seeing each of these movements and more um, come, to, uh, come, come to the idea of place as a way to more fundamentally address their cause. So preservation isn't just about preserving buildings, but about the use, the life of, of spaces. Uh, about creating places to best preserve the past and build new culture and new, new form that, that respects the past. Um, with transportation is a big example. Transportation is, has been about moving people around more and more and accomplishing less and less. We actually think mobility in many ways is the wrong goal. It should be accessibility, but even more important, places. We should start transportation planning with how do we create places people want to be, where they can accomplish many things at once, and envision our, our communities around a series of destinations that then become compatible with biking, walking, and transit. Just pushing biking, walking, and transit alone isn't really getting the paradigm shift. Um, but we can go into any one of those. But unfortunately, the, the dominant vision of where the future of cities is going is very much antithetical to great places. And if you Google the future of cities, the future of places, you get image li images like this. And, and this may or may not seem like where cities are going, but if you extrapolate out many of the dominant practices within the progressive wings of different disciplines, we're going in this direction. And this is 
a, a city, a vision that's really defined by, by objects, buildings, by icons, by, by frictionless mobility, by open space, by narrow definitions of greening uh, that we think are sort of misdirected ideas. And it's, it's not defined by people, by use, by culture, by local identity, by authenticity, uh, by, by, um, by comfort, by human comfort, and by, by the mixing and connecting and, 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 and drawing on the diversity and, and friction of people in life. Um, so there's, we notice small things in cities throughout that are sort of sometimes headed in this way uh, that we need to turn upside down. So we, we say, Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings, thereafter our buildings shape us. We say our pu we shape our public spaces, thereafter they shape us. The, uh, if, if the traffic engineer and the architect here on, the, on your left created an almost pedestrian-free environment in, in Houston. Um, and yet we go to places like, this is Oslo, but on vacation, and these are the kinds of places we become more attached to, perhaps, but they don't, they're not created through our existing planning and design processes. We don't realize the extent to which we're shaped by these spaces. People have been effectively designed out of many of our downtowns. Also in Houston, if you consider these five men if, uh, next to one of those columns, they'd be considered loiterers. We've made people feel like loiterers. We've designed people as loiterers as in many of our downtowns. You know, I want to talk about you know, issues of immigrants and refugees and how they become integrated. We, we've, we've made it very hard for them to feel integrated, for them to feel like contributors participants in public spaces in communities because of the way we've designed our public spaces. And we, we've worked in communities around Amsterdam to, to engage those communities in showcasing what they're proud of and contributing to public spaces um, and squares that, that, that enable the bridging of these divides, that enable res mutual respect and understanding uh, and so forth. Um, but uh, Jane Jacobs said, lowly, unpurposeful, random as they may appear, sidewalk contexts are the small change from which a city's wealth of public life may grow. And we think cities really fail and succeed at this human scale. And if we can create excuses for people to feel justified gathering, spending time in public spaces, that the rest of our goals in city building fall into place most, most easily. And the simple idea, William White, who, who was, we were set up to put into practice the, um, his work. Uh, he was an urban sociologist, uh, and his, his most simple idea is what attracts people most, it would appear, is other people. Uh, common sense, but we, we, we start with so many other things in city building, we forget the basic idea of how do we make places attractive to people. He said, it's, it's difficult to design a space that will not attract people. What's remarkable is how often this has been accomplished. So one of the major reasons that's happened is that we plan for cars and traffic. And, and we do it in subtle ways in th the design of buildings, the frictionless experience of, of our downtowns, of our, of our cities. Um, and this is the kind of experience you get crossing the street. And it's, in even, you know, it's even the same crossing the street in, you know, in front of this, this wonderful building in, so, in some small ways. There's, uh, and you don't go to downtown again after you've had an experience like that. You go to the mall, you stay at home. We, we've, we've created a fear based on, on cars and traffic. Even in some of the most dangerous communities defined by crime, you ask people what they're most scared of and they say they're most scared of traffic. Uh, yet we do very little. Certainly Sweden's leading the world in, in Vision Zero and that's been very inspiring. Um, but there's, there's much more, there, there's, it's not just about safety and death, it's about, about com human comfort and, uh, and children playing and elderly people feeling like they can be comfortable in a, in a community. So the way to turn this upside down isn't to be against the car or traffic, it's to be for people and places. Uh, it's to be for destinations. And it's remarkable how when you start that idea, as we did in, in Times Square, um, with just temporary chairs, all of a sudden how the feeling of a space can change, the, the idea of what a space can be can change. Um, but each discipline has really been planning narrowly for a narrow set of outcomes. The design disciplines, the development disciplines are limiting themselves, limiting demand for their professions, create, demand for their creativity um, by seeing design as an outcome alone, development as an outcome alone. Uh, and this era we think is changing, uh, perhaps ex exemplified by, um, by Guggenheim Bilbao, this got attention for a city, you can get great, we think you can get great outcomes from a design-led, icon-led 
project, but we think you can do much, much better than that. And so this is a beautiful building. I went here on my honeymoon. My wife gave me a short amount of time to go see it. Uh, we loved seeing it from here, but as we got closer, the sort of life of the city died off. It was hard to find the entrance. Um, the, uh, when you found the entrance, it's down these steps that you, uh, you step on the same foot each time you go down those steps. You feel smaller and smaller as you go down to the entrance. This couple was walking up the stairs uh, and had to rest coming, coming part way up. We didn't even want to go in. We felt so small as we got in there. So we, thought, we looked around uh, on a map and thought, on the waterfront side, it must be a really active, friendly place. This is, if you look at this map of the city, it should be the most friendly, interesting spot of the city. We went around there, and this is what we saw. These two men uh, effectively loitering there. And I took this picture to illustrate one of William White's quotes uh, that about blank walls. He says, blank walls reflect the power, the, the power of the institution, the inconsequence of the individual for whom they are clearly meant to put down, if not intimidate. And moments after I took this picture, these two men mugged the couple that had come around um, and I'm from New York City, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a mugging. I didn't do anything, but I told police, and they said, people get mugged right here all the time. And it's, this should be one of the safest, most friendly places in Europe, but because of the way it's designed, it, 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 it enables this. So, but if you go away from the building, human comfort, human affection, human connection resumes. It's not just experiencing the building as an object or consuming the building as an object, but it's participating in the city again. So, Rem Koolhaas actually recently said, the work we do is no longer mutually reinforcing. Each new addition reduces the sum's value. So I think the sort of Bilbao effect led to this era where each city was trying to define itself around an icon and getting some attention, but we're getting reduced, uh, reducing returns to scale. And in fact, these buildings are creating dissonance, and, and, uh, and they're simply just not realizing the potential of what buildings can, can contribute to cities, to, to make places. Um, and that one of the places this has been realized is Sadiyat Island in Abu Dhabi. And uh, this is, we, we um, were brought in after they did a very design development-led master plan, and uh, the, the, they brought in four of the most famous architects here, Norman Foster, Zaha Hadid, um, uh, a couple others, uh, and uh, well, Frank Gehry as well. And um, uh, here's the, the buildings they realized, but they realized they weren't going to get a lot of tra visitors. These weren't going to draw the visitors that they hoped to justify the expenditure. And they said, they brought us in to look at how do you improve the public spaces around them? How do you make real destinations that locals want to come to, that uh, have revenue generating resources that are about you know, that have good retail. We developed, the, we sort of turned the master plan upside down to start with the public spaces and the program for those spaces and how to layer different user groups it, throughout those spaces so people would circulate throughout the, 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 the area. One of the pl plans we developed was for a, a souk and a, a market district um, that was generated, you know, it was projected to generate many more visitors, locals and tourists, than these museums was, you know, to be revenue positive. Um, and to give a much more authentic local experience of, of, that, uh, of that city. Um, so Richard Stennett uh, s said at the recent Future of Places conference that we helped organize with the Axon Johnson Foundation and UN Habitat in July here, uh, said that growth means managing complexity that you don't simplify. Um, we, we've, all of our, our disciplines have been taught to order, to control, to, to, to organize, but really the best cities are, are, are very complex and layered and unpredictable. And it's how we create platforms for that life. Really the modernism started as more of a platform for life uh, and has somehow often become an effort to control and limit life. Um, Jane Jacobs said intricate minglings of different uses in cities are not a form of chaos. On the contrary, they represent a complex and highly developed form of order. Uh, so I think this, you know, this may, may be one of Sweden's weaknesses or ways that it's holding back and instead of allowing this life to emerge. How do, you, how do you create new culture? How do you create new identity and life in your cities? How, how, is, how, are, how are your cities and how, is, and how is your country defined by more than the beauty and, 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 um, and, and aesthetics of it, but by the, the people and the life and the, the culture that's created? That's here, but it's hidden sometimes behind the, the, the beauty of the cities alone. 
So just as different disciplines are in their silos defining planning for their outcomes, so are community institutions. And in each, each, each department, each, each institution has rarely talked to each other about how they can work together to create places. They all ha impact and often have public spaces onto them, themselves and, are, and have public community goals. But we find when you gather them together, you, are, you get amazing ideas. It's simply get, gathering these different institutions together to talk about how they can create places how they can uh, use their shared resources and ideas. The, uh, it's the, this magic always happens. And I will say that this culture house that we're in and some of the other institutions like this I've seen in Sweden are, are really uh, support that kind of magic and are, are institutions that we don't have in the US. Uh, uh, the, the layering of purposes and uses to spaces like this are really exciting. So but we think the future of communities is really leading with public spaces and then leveraging that by gathering institutions around it and how they can each contribute to public spaces. We want each institution competing to contribute to their shared value, and that's how they best win. Right now, in many of our, our, our communities, we have people competing to take value from their location. And there's a big risk of that in a city like this, that because of just accessibility alone, you, you get businesses that want to take value from its location rather than add value to the public realm, to the unique identity uh, and public realm of, of a city. So uh, Christopher Alexander um, wrote a book called The Pattern Language, and he was one of the, the founders of the idea of ecological design. But not long ago, he said, I don't want to hear about green buildings anymore. Sustainability is simply an extension of the technocratic society we find ourselves in. So we, I want to challenge us to move beyond sustainability, even beyond resilience, and talk about how do we have, not how do we just impact less and plan to not fail, but how do we create a big impact? How do we create a world that thrives? And through that, I think we can better accomplish resilience and sustainability. It's not that those aren't important. It's that I don't think we can accomplish those through on the track that we're on right now. Um, this is Green Building. This won Green Building Awards. It has a green roof. It's used sustainable materials but we couldn't figure out why the building was built to begin with. Um, so we need what we're calling an architecture of place. Is a, is a, a, we think we can ask more for architecture. We want, the crisis with architecture is that such a small percentage of the world is designed by architects, and of that, as Frank Gehry says, 99% of architecture is shit. Um, and the, the challenge is we're not asking enough of, of architecture. Uh, we're not asking it to create places, to, to be a part of a communities. Uh, we're, we're still asking it to, to, to win awards and to, uh, to be in magazines. Um, so yes, it should be sustainable. It, sh it should minimize its impact. It should use ecological materials. But these ideas alone are limiting architecture and landscape architecture design. Uh, they're holding it back. Uh, it should celebrate nature, sure, but that's not an end in itself. These metaphors are l privatizing public spaces, are, are preventing public spaces from becoming more multidimensional, from actually working. From us, we need public spaces to work, to justify their, our investment in them, to justify the natural elements in them, to reduce the impact on broader nature as well, to reduce the, 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 um, the, our, our impact on... on on, uh, on the natural world. Um, but the building should also generate life. It shouldn't just prevent life from dying. It should create life. We're not here uh, to, to, just, to just prevent the planet from dying. We're here to make the planet thrive and create and build our capacity as humanity to address issues, to, to solve our problems, to, uh, to, to create collective um, shared value. Um, that, that it's those, it's, it's great places and how we work together to shape them that are going to enable uh, our capacity as humanity to further work together um, and, and to address our global crises. Um, so here, this is the Melbourne City Council building. It's a green building. There's all these green features, but it's a humble building. It's also, it's, it steps back and creates a plaza in front that's really about life and people and multiple uses in that spaces. Um, and uh, 
But the project should also support its context. It shouldn't just be sensitive to context. We, we talk about, I mean, Frank Gehry says, I don't do context at all. Um, some, a lot of architects are trying to be contextual, but we think that's not enough. We want to be place-led. We want to add to the life of, this, of the place and um, support human comfort and pleasure uh, as, as the ultimate goal. These should be the outcomes we're, we're seeking to achieve um, with planning and design. Uh, all different types of human connection on one bench. But more than you know, just human comfort, it's about, it's about identity, it's about culture, it's about personality. Uh, how are we drawing out the, the personality of a community and, and showcasing that in, in, in cities? I think the, um, you know, we've, we've gone through an era where we, we can move where we like, where we can invest where we like, and there's been this myth that every city needs to be the same, to have the same amenities, facilities, aesthetics uh, to compete. In the future, it's going to be almost the opposite. It's going to be the cities that have a strong identity, a strong place attachment, a strong authenticity, a strong humanity, they're going to most thrive. Those are, we're going to, as we can move where we like and we can invest where we like, it's the cities that have a connection to place and a strong place identity that are going to attract those people. So that identity is formed at the human scale. And people are very sensitive to that. And so how we design, how we, how we engage is, is more important than ever. Um, this, so these are artist-designed benches that help illustrate this idea. Uh, we thought they were just cool benches when we took pictures of them. This is in Zurich, Switzerland. And uh, it, we realized after we took the pictures that the people on the benches matched the bench in some spontaneous way. Um, so these people look like they like mushrooms of some sort. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, these ladies over here look like their home may have similar uh, aesthetics and um, amenities, and these guys don't look like they would have sat on the other benches and seem like very avant-garde. And um, this guy looks like he may be a pharmacist, perhaps. Uh, these people look like their, you know, the decor in their home may be similar. But not only did people sit on the bench that matched their personality. They were sort of unconsciously drawn to that, perhaps. But they start to take on some of the personality of that bench. So you think about this, extrapolate out to communities, how we are drawn to the community that matches our personality, perhaps, but we are also take on that personality, how c the culture of the place creates us. These people don't realize it, but their, their likenesses are painted on the bench right behind them. And uh, these, these people wore the right color pants for that, for that bench. So, and then, of course, these guys picked the bench that matched their personality and were able to control that, that space. So people are so intuitive and discerning about place and how they choose to, where they choose to go and then how they behave based on it. We, we, we raise our level of behavior in great places. We feel connected to ourselves, to each, our best friends, but also to our, you know, our loose ties. And, and to, we make eye contact more likely in great places. We smile more often. Um, these are the outcomes that are the foundation of success in, in the cities of the future. Um, it's, not, it's no longer a softer idea. The, this is the qualities that we think make a great place. This is a diagram we've used for a long time, uh, 20 years or so. Um, and, you know, we think places are, we, we, we often look first at aesthetics, but we think it's important to take a step back and look at what are you doing in the space? What are the, what's the, the comfort and image, the identity of the space? How is the space connected and walkable and linked? And how is it sociable? And there's measurable ways of, of assessing these and uh, more, um, you know, more intuitive ways of assessing them as well. We're actually have a new partnership with Brookings Institution, um, that we're launching soon. It's a new center on, on innovation and placemaking, and we're developing metrics with them to look at the connection between place and innovation, uh, job creation, upward mobility, social integration, um, but, uh, but you know, also innovation in terms of new ideas, investment in, 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 in products, and there's an increasing realization that these need each other. There's, sort of, there's a lot of innovation districts that aren't really working as places. They're not creating the bump rates, the connections, the the attachment that entrepreneurship needs, that, uh, that social connections need. Um, but uh, 
likewise, great places are, need to be, we need to think more about how they integrate with these, these larger ecosystems of, of economic growth and, and social integration and upward mobility um, as well. So there was a study that really supported our diagram as, as a focus to economic development. Um, it's called the Knight Foundation's Soul of the Community. And going into the study, they'd never heard of place or placemaking. Um, and they thought, they wanted to know what leads people to be attached to place, to be attached to their community. And they thought it was going to be things like jobs and schools and healthcare and, and uh, economic standards. And there was almost no correlation between place attachment and those qualities. Um, but there was a very high correlation between three qualities. There were, there were cultural openness, opportunities for social engagement, and aesthetics. Very much the same qualities of our, of our place diagram. And, uh, but they also found that aesthetics alone would never lead to attachment. And it makes sense because you, you, don't, you never fall in love with a place or a, or a person just because of how they look. You fall in love with them because you like engaging with them socially and because they're open to you. Um, it's the combination of these together that works. So um, we're in, 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 of course, many communities are leaving out this cultural openness, this welcoming nature, and they're leaving out um, the opportunities for social engagement, especially with the issues around immigrants and, and, and refugees. Um, so we think you can redefine a city and redefine the conversation around a city, around place and destinations, and uh, this idea we call the power of 10. Um, we think a great place has at least 10 reasons to be in it, 10, 10 things to do there. And we think a good way to engage a community is what do you do in a space and what would you like to do there? We don't think communities are necessarily good at design or you know, a lot of the skills that professions have, but they're good at knowing what they do there and what they'd like to do there. And that information is very useful to designers. So our focus is more developing the program, the vision for the space. And uh, we think a great destination has at least 10 places in it, each with 10 things to do in it. And then perhaps a great city has 10 destinations, each with 10 places and so forth. Um, so New York, for example, we think New York has really been transformed more than anything by these public destinations. Its perception locally and internationally has been transformed because of these destinations. It's not, not so much because of the policing or because of the, um, the economy, although those are all factors. Um, but, and, and the city actually had very little to do with the transformation, the initial phases of the transformation of these destinations. Uh, it, was, it was communities working for many years, organizing, sometimes business improvement districts, sometimes community activists. Um, it was how they started and uh, the developing a vision for this, these places, organizing, and, now, and then how they morphed from visioning and organizing to actually managing these public spaces that is also, we think, the most important part of them. Uh, so how the community process, the placemaking process, built capacity to manage, fundraise, organize uh, these spaces. We think 90% of the success of a public space is, is because of its management. And that's, no one's trained in that. Cities don't usually support much, uh, they don't have a department for that um, or, or have much funding for that. But these spaces are all very well managed um, public spaces. They, we can go into the story of, of each one of them and you'll know many of them, the High Line and Union Square and Brooklyn Bridge Park and. Central Park, even the turnaround of Central Park was very much a community-led process, um, Times Square and so forth. Um, unfortunately, the, the story with each of these is, that's told is that it was, it was a top-down intervention and um, it was, it was uh, you know, or design-led intervention. And so the rest of the world is often copying sort of a very narrow version of the story that often we think shouldn't necessarily be copied. Um, and there's a much, there are many aspects of each of these that should be copied. Uh, so, time, so Bryant Park is an example of uh, a destination with 10 places in it uh, and uh, the, you know, many different layering of uses. And we, we actually did the master plan for this in 1980 um, that, that reflected sort of a new approach at that time. Instead of just policing and, and pushing out negative activity, the idea was to bring in positive activity and to, to really focus on small design changes in management and programming of space. Uh, and the, the managers of Bryant Park deserve most of the credit as, as they've really 
it continually iterated and evolved the space um, over time, but it's really at this human scale, at this place scale, that the, the Bryant Park comes alive. So we have gotten to work in cities you know, all over the world doing trainings and discussing um, this Power of Ten idea and having cities often evaluate themselves with a very simple exercise. And this is um, in Melbourne, we did this. Uh, Australia, this is maybe 10 years ago, um, where uh, or eight or nine years ago, I guess, the, um, the, this is, we had people from many different departments together to do this training, and they actually hadn't really met each other. Melbourne has this incredible urban design department that's maybe the best in the world, um, but it, it's so good that it was actually blocking the other departments from participating in placemaking. They had a, other departments had a lot of different skills and ideas and resources to contribute to it. Um, so they did this exercise, and the green dots were their favorite places, the red dots are places they avoid or feel unsafe, and the yellow dots are places they see as opportunities. And they were, they were surprised. They, you know, M Melbourne is you know, top-ranked as livability, and they'd done a great, great job creating, uh, you know, reclaiming the city from the automobile and creating uh, you know, tr mode shift towards transit and biking. But th th what they realized from this is there's, it's livable, but it's not necessarily lovable. There aren't many places that, are, that people really feel attached to or feel proud of. Um, there's the, the, the market and the library and some laneways and the, the Federation Square. But for tourists, that's half a day of, 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 of going through that space. And the tourism department you know, knew that that's where people go and that's, and that's it. But if you added a few more reasons to be to some of those yellow dots, you might have tourists spending a full day or two days in the space. And um, it's, it's not about changing anything on a big scale, not about infrastructure or big design projects, but about perp layering more purposes to some of these public spaces. Um, and this, again, is an example of a, one of their places that does work. That's, there's 10 reasons to be in this space, and it's not a big space, but there's uh, the public and private purposes to be in the, the, that space. We've done this exercise in, in favelas in, in Rio, you know, they all, no matter every context, we, we see urbanism really failing and succeeding at this human scale. And it comes down to the, you know, some of the best places, the best types of public spaces can be in these areas, and some of the worst and most feared and uncomfortable spaces are there as well. Um, so it's, it's uh, and we've done this exercise actually with, with Spacescape. Alexander uh, Stola brought us in um, to help kick off a, a Stockholm. Uh, public realm plan that they were doing, um, and we did a little exercise about what are people's favorite public spaces here, the, the ones that they really see in the center city, um, and uh, or the places people avoid uh, that they feel a little unsafe or sort of not proud of, uh, and then the opportunity places. And again, they saw that if you know if you focused on sort of more lighter, quicker, cheaper, short-term, low-cost elements that kind of, some people call it tactical urbanism, in some of these places, you could have a big, um, a big impact on how people perceive the city locally and internationally. Um, and, uh, it, it's, but it's more about organizing people in, those, in the, the city. It's not just about the city doing it for people. It's about... It's more about developing the management capacity from groups around that. We also had done trainings with AMF and some of the, the developers in the city city who, again, were all sort of looking at taking life from being so centrally located, but quickly understood the idea of, well, if they all start to contribute to the public realm, uh, and the ones that contribute the most will do the best, and they'll all, they'll all thrive if they, if they try, try to really add to authentic public spaces, um, not just sort of the mollification of the downtown. So we see an evolution of development going from project-led to place-led. And most cities are still project-led. They're still building facilities, roads, uh, parks, squares, buildings. It's just a project. It's a facility to deliver to their community. Um, better is discipline-led. Better than that is place-sensitive. And place-led is, is, is... A lot of cities are doing that informally, but not so consciously. Um, so, you know, this project driven is about facilities, problem focused, it's just about measuring costs. Um, discipline led is, you know, bring in the best experts, the best designers, the best, the most creative people and have them come up with something. And you can do a lot better that way. 
and you can, you can measure you know, the value produced from that. Uh, it's still a very linear, predictable approach. Um, but uh, place sensitive is sort of the best practice within the disciplines. Is the, you know, they're, they're being very responsive, they're being multidisciplinary, uh, they're doing a lot of community engagement, getting input from the community before they develop their solutions. Um, they're mitigating the negative environmental impacts, cultural, historic preservation impacts. Um, but they're still, they're still controlling the conversation a little bit. They're still telling everybody that we've got it, the disciplines are, are progressive enough. Um, you, you don't, you, you, this is as far as we can get. And that's not going to get us far enough. Place led is where we make it everyone's responsibility to create an active public realm, where we challenge communities to not just give us ideas and, um, and you know, res support these efforts, but to actually come up with ideas, implement them th themselves, where we, where every, you know, th th we're preventing any one discipline or de sector or department from dominating the process. We need to draw on many different uh, elements of it and it's this idea of place capital. Is the shared, we're all trying to create the shared wealth of our public realm is the factor that's going to lead to the most shared success. And in a lot of ways, the, the places that we most love in the world are organized informally to create place capital. Um, the places we don't love are the ones that are trying to degrade place capital. Um, so with the, the last Future of Places conference in Stockholm, um, Fran Tonkis of LSE Cities said, C cities are not built forms, they are social forms. We must design from social life, not for it. So it's so a very powerful and simple idea that almost seems obvious, but as city planners, as master planners, as designers, it's, it's, it's almost antithetical. And uh, when, we've, when we've done work in the Netherlands a, a lot, we, you know, we ask them, well, you know, you're, you're doing great, you have great public spaces, why would you want us to help train you or facilitate the conversation. And they say that um, traditional planning is you do community process, then you design, and then you hope it gets used. They see placemaking is a much more iterative approach. F designing from the public process, experimenting, temporary I interventions, ex uh, uh, it's, it's, it's never over, and throughout the process, it builds capacity of that community. It's a, it creates a learning culture where you're all learning from each other. It's a campaign for big change, but it's, it's educating and inspiring everybody, and it's realizing that you're never finished. Um, so most planning is still this project-driven approach where you get public input after the, the ideas have been defined by disciplines, and the only way the community engages is to say no, or to just passively say, okay, cool, that, that's okay, but they don't really take ownership over that, that place. Um, the placemaking process really turns that upside down. It starts with the community, with the places, uh, and as broadly as possible, but quickly looks at what are these, you know, through like the power of 10 exercise, you can define the opportunities and looks at those specific places to develop a program a programmatic vision of uses for those spaces that then um, you can start implementing in some ways in short-term, low-cost ways uh, and building and evaluating those, making mistakes, learning from them, uh, and hopefully coming up with something much bolder than you would have through a more narrow, linear process. Um, so we're seeing this culture, this process really taking form in, in several cities, but per Detroit perhaps more than any other city. In Detroit, and Michigan is, this, is the area we've actually worked more than any other in the U.S. Um, and, and it's really being transformed by its public destinations. In the downtown, um, we've recently led a public realm um, placemaking plan with a lot of short-term elements that have been implemented. Um, but about 15 years ago, we, we first did a, a plan for their central square. This was the very center of Detroit, really defined by roads moving through it. Um, and in a way, Detroit had been a, a victim of all the big silver bullet approaches to economic development and to transportation and to, you know, attracting companies uh, and, and, and giving them big subsidies and really everyone, again, taking value from the city. And that was very much reflected from the gutted downtown that was there. 
and the, the fortress-like buildings that the headquarters of, that were left um, uh, reflected. Um, so we did a plan that developed this campus Martius. Uh, there was no public money. That the, the vision that we developed attracted the $20 million that was needed to build it. In the couple years after it was built, it attracted uh, $2 billion worth of, of investment um, into the blocks around it, including CompuAir, moving their headquarters downtown. And those, those billions of, of dollars were, are, of investment are credited with keeping the viability of downtown Detroit and perhaps the city as a whole through the worst of the economic downturn in 2008. And shortly after 2008, uh, Dan Gilbert, uh, another a billionaire, brought his Quicken Loans company downtown and, and then worked with us to um, and bought up 40-something buildings uh, by now. And he worked with us to d develop a, this public realm master plan, um, which has really changed the perception of Detroit uh, drastically through very simple, no, no big fancy design efforts or, or big investments. Um, it's really changed the, the perception of downtown Detroit locally and globally. And um, we got this beach there and, and it's created a lot of mixing and a lot of pride and identity in the city. But the larger narrative isn't just that people are consuming Detroit as a, as a cool city. It's that they're, everyone can feel like they can help shape it. It's this idea that, that, that uh, we don't just consume our world anymore. The cities that are going to most compete in the, in the world are the ones that invite people to help shape it, whether that's how they participate in the public space, how they participate in planning, how they, they are su supported to be culturally engaged and creative. Um, it's not just for the cultural creatives or the talented people, but it's how we draw that out in everybody, draw out the, everybody's talent and creativity and ideas. Um, and so these ideas of placemaking are being applied in the poorest parts of Detroit as well. The, um, this is a, an intersection in, that you know, really only has um, uh, a grocery store and, and a couple homes left. And the idea is to, to rebuild the, these sort of bombed out areas of Detroit through finding assets and groups of people that want to create destinations and nodes of activity um, and engaging them where they are uh, in their community. And this was the plan that they came up with with us, and and we engaged them during you know public workshops in in their spaces, and we're we're doing a, a lot of this now throughout the city, and um, but, you know we obviously do workshops like this throughout the world, um, and this is they said they want a place to play dominoes and to relax and sit down. This was an old gas station that that failed, and this is a place that they're really connected to and proud of, and it's not that expensive. But it's at this scale that you know neighborhoods of all sizes and and um, economic levels you know really thrive. Um, quickly, a little bit about New York. Um, we led in uh, 2005, 2006, a campaign called the New York City Streets Renaissance Campaign that was designed to help the city rethink its streets and to move beyond the issue of bikes versus cars versus um, transit or, or so forth and. Uh, to, to thinking about how do we create great streets and how do, the, how do great streets create health and economic activity and life and, and, and pride in the city. Um, and our funder, the goal our funder gave us was to get the tra Transportation Commissioner fired. Um, and, uh, and we were successful. And we, uh, but what, mostly we were successful in building, a, connecting individual organizers and activists throughout the city uh, and helping them articulate their visions locally and citywide um, for how to transform areas like the Meatpacking District um, before the High Line got there and um, to, to be on their terms, not to be in the terms of the tourists through the very design-led approach of the High Line. Um, we gathered activists from all up and down Broadway and um, talked about how we could close sections of it, create defined Broadway around destinations rather than very dangerous intersections. Um, we, did, we worked with Union Square and with uh, Times Square to, to, to build the case for improving them as public spaces for closing parts of them. Um, and uh, this is, you know, the, the, the images that really showed, you know, were powerful in New York and globally um, uh, that, you know, are now, this, in the last couple of weeks, have actually been challenged by the mayor and the police commissioner saying they might want to reopen this to traffic. Uh, that's, that's ignited this very teachable moment where we can all learn what's working about this and what's not. And we actually do think in some ways they're right in that we can't just close, we can't just create public space and it works. And we, and we were always concerned that we just gratuitously close 
streets. It, we need a vision for what to do with these spaces. We need to develop, develop the management capacity to invest in them. Um, it's, it's, you know, the fresh experiment worked, but then you have to keep evolving and iterating and improving. You're never finished. Um, so, but it's, a, it's still a powerful vision of what public space can be and the uses that are there now. Um, and the debates that are there now. And we want everyone continually debating what public space should be for, who should use it. Uh, and that, if it's framed right, that only makes public space better, and it makes our, de our democracy better, our, our culture stronger. Um, and this, is, this idea, this focus on place and place making can be a way we actually reinvent government. In Adelaide, Australia, and a lot of Australian cities, we're working to um, Restru reinvent and restructure government around place. This is the last example. Um, this is, they, they came to New York, the Lord Mayor and the CEO, um, at different times and uh, looked at the, the, the lighter, quicker, cheaper approach that we got going there with the public plaza program. And um, they said they wanted to do similar things, but they saw this as a way to reinvent the way they interact with the communities, the way they build the capacity of communities to do placemaking. Um, they, this was the kickoff event of, of one of these programs, but they said that the point of government is actually to, not just to deliver projects, but to d build the capacity of communities uh, to govern themselves. And in a way, in Australia, government's very strong and very progressive and very innovative, but there's actually not much innovation and, and engagement from communities. Uh, so they see as you go from project-led to place-led, uh, that you actually get, you, you build the capacity of communities, of citizens over time. When we're project-led and discipline-led, we're often degrading the capacity of engagement of communities to take responsibility, to, do, to make their, their public realm thrive. Um, so, the, so the goal of, of government in, in, in these efforts is they're in how Adelaide's working is they're measuring their success based on place capital and based on the capacity that they're building in communities to, 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 uh, to manage themselves. Uh, and no longer defined by their different, each department's goals, but by the, by the shared goal where every department's goal is to create place and to create um, place investment. So I'd love to you know, continue this conversation um, with people, uh, and I don't know if there's, if there's questions or not, but the, um, we, you know, we, think, we think placemaking is a really big idea that just framing the conversation draws out great conversations in, on every scale in cities and um, ideally draws out the best of the skills and creativity of everybody. Uh, it's about framing it differently, and it's about thinking bigger about how we shape our world and how it's everybody's job to help shape a world that thrives. So thank you very much for having me here. <laughs>